I am Ashanti Harris and I am a multidisciplinary visual artist and researcher and in my work I'm interested in exploring themes of identity and diaspora through a multidisciplinary practice so my work sometimes takes the form of performances sometimes it takes the form of videos of sound works of sculptural installations sometimes it's writing and sometimes it's research and so today I'm going to talk to you about a project that I was working on over 2018 to 2020, which has been exploring the legacies of Guyanese women in Scotland in the 18th and 19th centuries. But before I start, I wanted to give you an, an introduction to my art practice, because it is through my creative practice that I've been undertaking this research project. So I'm just going to flip through some slides. Um, so I originally trained in sculpture. As both an artist and a researcher, I feel most comfortable when engaging with materials and working through physical processes. It was whilst I was studying sculpture that I first began working with performance as another medium in my art practice, exploring making as a performative act and considering its relationship to physicality, movement and dance. I worked with my own body to perform tasks which embodied, and embodied sculptural processes. And this is a work that I made called Emmy Ore Ashe, which was a sculptural installation and performance. So when I graduated, um, I began working with dance more and more. I became part of a collective called Glasgow Open Dance School, which facilitated experimental movement research with a focus on dance as the experience of movement rather than the kind of performance of movement. So um, Gods was about taking part and listening to how different kinds of movement feels in your body and listening to what movement can teach you. Uh, in 2016, I co-founded Project X which is an organisation which platforms dance from the African and Caribbean diasporas in Scotland. The intention behind Project X was to use dance as a way to physically and creatively learn about history and culture alongside its contemporary impact. So dance for me is first and foremost an embodied practice. It is history and memories archived within the body and accessed physically from person to person through direct encounters between individuals. So when I dance Akpi, which is a traditional dance I learn in the Volta region of Ghana, or Duple technique, which is a contemporary African dance technique, which was taught to me by a choreographer in Glasgow, I am embodying these histories and their associated narratives passed from person to person until they reach me and the narrative continues as I teach these dances to other people. So when I dance these dances, I am mapping my relationship to their associated histories in my body and when I share my movement, I am sharing my personal history. I also apply this thinking to working with sculptural materials and processes. I like to work with traditional craft and fabrication pr practices, which embody cultures, ancestral legacies and human lived experience. And so this is an image of some sculptures I made using a technique called the lost wax technique, which was developed in Ghana and also across the Americas. So um, by working with this process called the lost wax technique, I was gaining a physical relationship to the histories and cultures associated with the techniques by physically doing them. So my recent projects have been centered in deconstructing colonial and post-colonial narratives and reimagining them from an African Caribbean diasporic perspective, working with sculptural processes and archival objects alongside a participatory and performative framework. The artworks I create function as a form of post-colonial critique, challenging dominant representations of history in order to reimagine the boundaries of social and cultural norms and imagine a more holistic representation of history and culture. So a representation which includes more perspectives. I consider myself to be a researcher and I'm really dedicated to historical research and creating educational artworks which teach but also aim to empower communities. 
So um, I wanted to start this presentation with an introduction to these different elements in my previous work, as all of them have been a continuous inspiration and influence on the work that I'm going to share with you today. So let us begin. So um, I'm going to be talking to you about a research project that I have been working on and I've been calling it the Forgotten Diaspora Project. So um, the Forgotten Diaspora Project is informed by the work of David Alston, who is a Scottish historian based in Cromarty and whose research looks at the historical relationship between Scotland and Guyana, which is the country that I am from. So to give you some background on this historical relationship, my notes. So um, the Republic of Guyana that you can see, well, actually, you can't see in this image. This image is um, when back when uh, Guyana was known as British Guyana. But in the contemporary day, the Republic of Guyana is a Caribbean country on the coast of South America, bordered by Venezuela, Brazil and Suriname. Guyana is a former colony of the British Empire and is historically known as the last frontier of British colonial expansion in the West Indies. The country was populated by enslaved and indentured people who worked the plantations, um, enslaved people from uh, across Africa and indentured people who were brought over later from India and China. So it is little known that Scots were prominent among the plantations in Guyana as plantation owners um, and as high society people. And by the mid 1790s, the European population of these colonies were predominantly from the highlands of Scotland. And consequently, this colonial relationship to Guyana led to the movement of Guyanese people to Scotland over the 18th and 19th centuries. So part of David Alston's research assembles historical records of Caribbean people of African heritage in Scotland during the 18th and 19th centuries. And it's actually taken from David Alston, the title, The Forgotten Diaspora Project, which is an essay that David's written about uh, the Guyanese people in Scotland. And uh, David's research details uh, these people's journeys, their Scottish connections and the places in which they worked and resided. So um, taking David's research as a starting point, I began to explore the historical presence and hidden legacies of this forgotten diaspora from my own perspective as a Guyanese woman in Scotland. I wanted to learn who these women were and discover the impacts they had on their various communities. So um, for most of these women, all I had was a name, I'll go back to the name, one of the names, a date, and maybe a location, maybe two locations. So I decided to begin my research with a series of reenactments, so to speak. So I began by traveling to the places that they were recorded to have been, walking the routes they may have taken. So in one case, um, one woman I was looking at's name was Elizabeth Juna, and I had a record of the place that she lived and a record of the place that she worked as a tailor. So I walked just that journey from the place that she lived to her home and started to think about how that journey felt in my body and how that could create a connection to this woman who walked the same path over 200 years before I was. Um, I walked on the shores and the seas that they might have travelled on. I tried to think about finding locations that, that didn't change with time. So a beach, a shoreline, a forest, there's a lot that stays the same over time in those places. And I went to buildings, to churches that could have been their churches. I sang Guyanese songs whilst I was there. I visited graves. And I also talked to lots of people and also talked a lot to David, who um, is based in one of the locations that some of these Guyanese women were recorded to have been. So I'm just going to skip through some images from this research trip that I was doing. Uh, this is the grave of Elizabeth Juno, one of the women. Um, and, and yeah, sitting, sitting on a harbour, 
you can see from the kind of industrial background of all of the things that would be different but I guess the kind of land the land and the sea is the same uh, and and talking to people and reading things um, and I also wanted to think about how I could feel the weight of these women so I made sculptures um, in bronze I made bronze plaques with these women's names I'm just going these are some pictures of making these sculptures um, in, in bronze because it felt like it had the kind of prestige that I wanted this research project to have but also because it's heavy and I just I really wanted to understand the weight of these women the weight of their stories and the weight of their legacy so I carried these bronze plaques with me as I went to the different locations that they had a connection to and I also made things I worked with uh parts of the environment, motifs from the environment that I was, environments that I was moving through, um, looking for clues about this history and thinking about how I could work with the imagery. This um, sculpture says Berbis, and Berbis is a region of Guyana that when I was particularly walking around Cromarty, which is where David Alston was based, um, there was, there was clues to Berbis everywhere. It was written in stonework, it was etched, it was it was everywhere. So kind of working with some of this imagery. And I recorded here's some of the bronze plaques. Um, I, rec I read, I read so much, uh, I made things, I recorded sounds, I recorded videos, I spoke to people and I did so much writing. And I'll just skip through some of these images. And, and I, with all of these experiences, I, I was starting to build an understanding and from my own personal narrative of who these women might have been alongside who they were to me and what they meant to me in this, the present moment that I was researching them. But I also wanted to speculate on these women's lives with other women who had a personal connection or relationship to their stories. So in 2019, uh, this research contributed to a participatory performance work, which I developed with Scotland-based women of African and Caribbean heritage. And this was titled Second Sight, and this is one of them, images from that work. So um, the performance and installation of Second Sight dissected the ways in which the histories of these women are present in the day-to-day -day experiences of each woman participating. The work was created and exhibited in Civic Room Gallery, which is a mercantile era building in Glasgow city centre with a complex history and connections which overlap with the histories of these women and Scottish colonial legacies and the associated subjugation of black identities. So the performance was very much a process of reconfiguring these historical narratives and taking ownership of them from both an individual and a community collective perspective. And we did this with our bodies. So um, inhabiting this colonial space, this colonial building like ghosts, we each drew from our individual kinesthetic or movement narratives and we performed them with our eyes closed. And part of performing with our eyes closed was to kind of follow feeling rather than any kind of style of technique and really allow these histories and the space that we were inhabiting to kind of be reflected in our movement and to be processed through our movement in our bodies, especially because as women of African and Caribbean heritage, our bodies was the place that we generally felt the contemporary impacts of this history. Some Second Sight was presented as an installation which embedded the performance within a wider body of artwork, responding to the legacy of four women particularly, who were called Doll Thomas, Elizabeth Gina, Elizabeth Swain Bannister and Suzanne Kerr. And I'm gonna share a video a little bit later of two videos elaborating on the stories of two of these women. And here's some images of the performance. I'll skip through as I continue talking. So um, in between, sorry, I've lost my train. So in between the performances, um, 
alongside the performances, there were a kind of there was a, an installation of fabric sculptures, bronze plaques, and a series of short stories which sat amongst the wider growing narrative. And in between the performances, some of the kind of sensory movement instructions that we used as a collective to kind of de process some of the kind of quite complex and painful histories that were coming up through these women's stories also played into the room so that anybody who also was feeling this kind of heavy weight of the stories could also kind of engage in some of these movement, these kind of breathing, these sensory bodily awareness exercises and almost just kind of breathe through it. So the next outcome of this research then was an exhibition titled the skeleton of a name just slowly getting to the exhibition through these images of some of the performers here we go and the skeleton of a name uh, drew together all of the kind of sculptural works writing stories poetries almost like archive that i'd created through the research process and in, in whilst I was trying to speculate on these women's stories and essentially I like to think of the skeleton of a name as silence made material and presented as an archive in varying forms which could be seen as quite disparate or disconnected but I guess it was inviting the audience to think about how you can elaborate on history from your own perspective so where does uh, your root of speculation go when you look at a sculpture, when you read a specific poem written by a specific Caribbean author, when you watch a performance and when you touch a piece of fabric, how does that lead you on your own kind of understanding of, um, of a history and how does it lead you to build your own narrative? And alongside, and then the kind of final iteration of the research of this research, uh, I made a sound work which was called History Haunts the Body, uh, which is now being included in the Scottish National Gallery's collection as a contemporary portrait in sound of these women. So that feels like a really um, important kind of ending to this research project that is really important to me that they've kind of found their place in history within, I guess, this wider historic institution. Um, so History Haunts the Body tells the story of four Guyanese women who, along with their children, were part of Scottish society in the 18th and 19th centuries. Their complex histories are recounted by a single female voice, accompanied by outdoor, rural and coastal soundscapes, recorded in various locations where the women were known to have lived or visited. A soundscape recorded at Cromarty Harbour, in the Black Isle provides a transportive undercurrent to the audio narration from beginning to end. And alongside these kind of soundscapes, there is a second voice, which is mine, that's kind of talking through these body awareness, sensory awareness, um, breathing exercises. And I guess I was really thinking about who is listening to these women's stories, who is holding the weight of them. And once these stories enter your body through the act of listening to them, what do you do with them? How do you share them? How do you let them grow? Um, and how do you process them? Um, so that is the end of my presentation just now and I'd now like to show you some videos uh, about these two of these women that I'd been researching to start to understand their stories a little bit better. So this is a video that I made about Doll Thomas.
Who do you think is in Glasgow? A merchant wrote teasingly to his wife. But Gilbert Robertson's mother-in-law, Doll Thomas, with about 19 of her children and grandchildren, come home for education. Doll Thomas, also known as Dorothy Kerwin, Dolly Kerwin and Mrs Dorothea Thomas, was described by one traveller as the Queen of the Demeron, and by another as the richest woman in the colony. Yet she was described by most as a negress. Doll Thomas was born a slave in Montserrat in 1760 and soon taken to a plantation in Demerara, Guiana. By developing a relationship with the person whom she was made to call master, she bore him two daughters and used this leverage to secure both her emancipation and a certain amount of financial security. By 1785, Doll was 25 years old and a free woman in nearby Grenada with three children, Elizabeth, Fanny and Charlotte. Her wealth was increasing. She had a house in her name and a number of enslaved people she had been gifted to support herself and her children. In 1797, she was able to manumit one of her slaves, referred to only by the single name Betty. Betty was Doll's own mother, given to her as a gift by the Montserrat planter, John Kerwin when Doll herself was manumitted 13 years earlier. When Doll met her partner, Joseph Thomas, a doctor in Grenada, she was already an extremely wealthy woman. She had five more children, Anne, Eliza, Joseph, Harry and Christina. In the early 19th century, Joseph Thomas passed away and Doll returned to Demerara, where she used her wealth to secure the title of Mrs. Dorothea Thomas. Yet, Mrs. Dorothea Thomas was a title that was rarely afforded to her. The Demerara Gazette allowed her the surname, but insisted upon using the title Miss, suggesting a previous ownership by Joseph Thomas, rather than a partnership. But Doll Thomas was made of strength and continued to insist upon her title. She was fiercely persistent, boundlessly determined and in 15 years of emancipation had generated an incredible amount of wealth. Like most mothers of wealth in the early 19th century, her main concern was the security of her children, particularly her daughters and granddaughters, for whom she secured partners of status and means. In Demerara, these people of means were Scots. In 1810, she came to Glasgow to ensure her children and grandchildren were well educated. She returned in 1823 to visit her grandchildren at Dollar Academy and stayed with her daughter Christina and her husband, who both lived in Glasgow. But this was not the only purpose of her visit. From Glasgow, Doll travelled to London with a memorial from the people of colour addressed to the King and both Houses of Parliament. These were a series of petitions protesting the denial of full civil and legal rights presented from the free coloured citizens of His Majesty's West Indian colonies. Doll Thomas fought hard for her own status, the status of her family. I'm sorry, I don't know why I did that. Let's see if I can... Back in. Okay, let's try this again. In both Houses of Parliament. These were a series of petitions protesting the denial of full civil and legal rights presented from the free coloured citizens of His Majesty's West Indian colonies. Doll Thomas fought hard for her own status, the status of her family, the status of her people. In 1837, she arrived in London dressed with diamonds in her hair, a necklace of gold blooms, ostrich feathers, and a skirt made of five pound notes sewn together. Her custom was to stuff her close acquaintances with tamarinds and preserved ginger, yams and guava jelly. She gifted her young relatives in Britain with playthings from Guiana, peggles, calabashes, clubs, and Amerindian poisoned arrows 
of which some were sent to the British Museum and may still be there to this day. going to stop that one there because I would really like to show you uh, another one. Uh, so that was Doll Thomas um, who is a very particular character of all of the women that I was researching. Doll Thomas more than anyone else had so many references within archives um, because of the kind of elaborate nature of who she was and her very unique story. Doll Thomas um, featured in the kind of usual archival records that you would come across, um, censuses, kind of travel records. But Doll Thomas also, because of kind of moving within high societies, also featured in kind of newspaper and gossip columns as well. Um, I felt like Doll Thomas had already been uh, speculated upon at the time and I had access to some of those kind of archival documents of that so kind of building on bringing all these elements together and building on Dolls Thomas's story um, felt a little bit simpler to a certain extent than, um, than some, this other uh, woman whose name was Elizabeth Juna and I will play you her video just now. Elizabeth Juno, known as Eliza Juno, was born in 1804 in Essequibo. It is presumed her mother was either an enslaved woman or a free woman of colour from Demerara. But there are no records to identify her by name. Her father was Hugh Juno, a carpenter from the Black Isle who travelled to the colonies and bought a half share in the Timber estate industry in Essequibo. In 1816, at age 12, Eliza left Guyana for Scotland with her father and brother, where they were both christened in Rose Mackey. She attended Fortrose Academy and in 1818 received an award for proficiency in penmanship. In 1817, her father remarried Martha Matheson, daughter of Chief of Clan Matheson. Five years later, her father died and her stepmother remarried Reverend Archibald Brown, first Presbyterian chaplain in Demerara. Archibald Brown was a supporter of slavery who had published three sermons in pamphlets from 1824 on the duties of subjects to their sovereign and the duties of slaves to their masters. When Archibald Brown entered into her family, Eliza was 22 years old. At some point before 1837, Eliza left Scotland for London and at age 33, she had an illegitimate daughter named Emma, born on the 15th of November at 18 Great Hermitage Street in Wapen, London. Emma's father is recorded to have been Thomas McGregor, gentleman born in Kirkhill, Scotland. In 1841, Eliza was living in Brixton with her daughter. By 1851, 
Emma was enrolled in a private boarding school in Somerset and Eliza had returned to Scotland. Separated from her stepmother, Eliza was living in Fortrose on the south side of the High Street with her 60-year-old aunt Catherine Mackenzie and worked as a dressmaker. In 1861, on the census day, Elizabeth Juno, 57, dressmaker, was recorded to be living at 3 Union Street for Trolls, still with Catherine Mackenzie, now a widow aged 70 and proprietor of the cottage. Her daughter Emma was recorded to have been visiting at the time, now 23 years old and working as a governess. Elizabeth Juno died on the 20th of April, 1861. The cause of her death was unknown and was reported by a daughter, Emma, who was caring for her mother at the time. She was buried in Rosemarkey and a stone in her memory was erected in the Kirkyard, along with her brother, who died in Buenos Aires. sharing. Um, so Elizabeth Juna's story, I, I really uh, like Elizabeth's or Eliza's story in contrast to Doll Thomas's. Um, in terms of thinking about this idea of legacy and what we understand as legacy, um, Elizabeth Juna lived her life, fell in love, had a child, um, had a job, went to school, won an award for penmanship like I guess the the kind of everyday reality of her life it's I guess it's not something that people would necessarily think of as legacy but knowing that she existed and that she did all of that that she that she existed uh, when she did and also in those places as well in Scotland that is really Elizabeth Gina's legacy and that was something that a lot of the women that I was working with to kind of elaborate on these women's stories really kind of held on to that kind of feeling of I can't believe they were there. I can't believe they survived. I can't believe they existed with a stepfather who was a supporter of slavery and a mother who was uh, an enslaved person. And, and the fact that all of that kind of, that all of the complexities of her story happened and she existed, that, that really was Elizabeth Juna's legacy. And all of the same complexities are present in Doll Thomas's story uh, in really, really different ways. And I really enjoyed to kind of put them side by side and think about them with other people. And, and I guess think about how the stories, the speculation of the stories continue. Um, even after kind of stop stopping working on this research project, every time I return to uh, these video works or the sandworks. <laughs>